Hi, my name is Cheryl Metcalf and welcome to my studio. We are Studio 6 in Coeur d'Alene. We're in the Rockford building. Um, we've been here, I've been here about a year and I really enjoy the space. Um, for downtown Coeur d'Alene we get to be part of the studio tour every month and it's just a wonderful um, space to work in. Uh, I have two studios, one in my home and I have this one. So this one's definitely um, a really nice public place. Um, and um, I work in bronze. Um, I facilitate a class every Tuesday from 5.30 to 8.30. And we always um, work in an oil-based clay and always have a live model. Um, it's open to the public. It was started by Terry Lee years ago. I started with Terry Lee probably, um, I'm going to guess, about 15 years ago. And so I learned from Terry Lee, and he learned from George Carlson, so it's kind of a trickle-down effect. You might see some of my heavier texture. I'm not saying I do anything like George Carlson, but probably some of that, my technique might kind of come from Terry Lee and George Carlson. Um, I took a lot of education in um, Northern, Southern California um, with um, Andrew Cross and speed sculpting and anatomy. So that's been a big part of my education. Um, right now I teach whoever wants to be helped in the class on Tuesday nights. So an awful lot of my pieces will come from the model that we had. This particular model was a model we had last year and I embellished her with some wings and she became an angel. Um, the patinas on my bronzes are, um, they can really vary. I go from, um, I kind of pull from what sells and what people like. This is um, another angel um, and I, she sits in her wings so she's a carefree angel and she's quite stuck to the sand. There she goes, she's just heavy. So she's only connected at her toes. And her back of her wings was, a, it was she was the first wings, set of angel wings that I did. So there was a lot of remaking the wings. Um, but I really like them once I finally, finally kind of got the feel for it. And this uh, model was somebody, I had a um, two day um, show, I guess, up in Sandpoint. So I had other bronzes to show, but I hired a young gal to come up and sit for me for a couple days. So each day she would come. So I sculpted her. Of course, she wasn't nude there, but um, I sculpted her there and then came home and embellished her with wings. And this young lady is Carefree Allie. And she was supposed to get wings, but she wasn't very angel-like, so she never earned her wings. She's kind of a little bit, kind of a little bit of a floozy. So I really like her. She's just kind of a small, fun piece. This is a piece um, I call the Mountain Man. And he actually also was a model and in our sculpture class on Tuesday nights. So a lot of times the class is working along and um, maybe I finish before the class. Um, so I embellish, so I got online and hunted for pictures of the mountain men and um, so I, I found one that was pretty cool and kind of copied some of their, um, just some of the things that they wore and um, so this is, I forget the little name what he's called, uh, ooh, I can't remember, but they often would have feathers so if you were to get closer in here there's bear claws and there's a rattlesnake. Um, tail. So it's just a fun piece that kind of came out of a, another piece to come out of the class and it's a good seller as well so have a good time with that. Um, I first started sculpting um, because I came across a, a sculptor in the garden tour, Coeur d'Alene garden tour years and years ago and her name was Mickey Manx that had this beautiful sculpture of clay and um, I was drawn to it and asked her um, about her piece and so she started to tell me about Terry Lee's class and my daughter is quite an artist. My daughter's name is Jessica. I have two children. Um, my son is Kevin and my daughter Jessica and um, 
hoping to inspire her. Um, I was very encouraged by this woman sculpting a um, full figure. So I went and met Terry Lee and he told me that I could set up that my daughter for that class that was just beginning that night. I went and bought the clay and the tools and I couldn't wait for my daughter to come home from high school. And when she came home, I presented her with my gift and it wasn't well received. She pretty much told me that that was my thing, not hers. I was very saddened and frustrated. So I did go take the class myself. And when I walked in, um, they were measuring a nude model, very uncomfortable. So I didn't look, I walked past to where they were working on another room where they were building the armatures got busy in there and eventually I had to go face the model that was nude. And so Terry showed us how to um, get your clay ready and build up your piece. And um, I was hooked from that minute on. I couldn't get my clay on my armature fast enough. I dreamt about it every single night. I couldn't wait for the next Tuesday. And here I am still doing the same thing. Um, insane passion. I, I think about it, I still dream about it. Um, I live it. Um, I do have a day job and someday that maybe this will be all I do, but it doesn't matter how little time I'm, I get with it or, or much uh, time I'm away from it. Um, all I can, when I'm back at it, it's just like, it just is so absorbing. It just, it's, it just is, it takes all of, it takes all of my thought process. Um, I don't think about what's going on around me. It's just, it's just a passion. An armature is the skeletal of a piece. Um, so an armature, this is, a, this is one that was used, and it's actually one that you can actually hold in your hand. Um, this is a very, it's a, basically a stick figure of a person. It has a little small. Um, there's some brown clay on it, but you can bend it into any shape that your model might be in, um, minus the tail here. So, and then you, that's what your, that's what holds your piece. So in this case, this girl has, she's um, got just one of these wires, except for instead of where I would hold this, this threaded rod is actually welded to this part in here. So, and it's a lot stronger wire. And that's what builds the form, holds the form for the clay. And this, because it's thin enough, when you go to mold a piece, all my pieces um, go to bronze, so you can take a hacksaw and cut through that and remove a piece because you can't mold it all in one piece. It has to, generally has to be separated. When I did the um, Chief Morris antelope, um, the large piece that's out by the college, I think that that was just short of 50 pieces. So you have to use a bigger saw. If I don't take a piece to bronze, if it doesn't get cut up, I can take it apart, reuse the armature. But generally, when uh, on Tuesday nights, the first time we have a new model, we measure the model, and we um, decide what scale we're gonna scale it down to. So the measurements um, are, are all recorded. And so that is what, that's what, we go by so this piece has a lot of measurements and then you'll take it and you'll, this is what we'll do to make the inner piece so we know exactly the inside measurements of that person so all these measurements with bottom of the foot the knee inside the hips inside the shoulders and so that's how we build this armature and so it's quite it's there's a lot of math to it and depending on the size of how big you want your piece, a common size, we might reduce it by to 30% of actual size. And most of these pieces, that's why they look kind of uniform, are 30%. It doesn't use as much clay. Um, a lot of times if you're going to do a life size or larger than life size, you'll make about 30%, 50%, and you'll scale up and you kind of make a couple different. And this would be called a maquette. Um, a small piece. If I were going to go large, life size, this would be called a maquette, and it would um, we'd scale it up as I um, went larger. All right. Well, so I also kind of like animals. So there's a lot of bears, 
living in the North Idaho, you just sculpt bears and the first thing you do is you determine um, if a piece needs to be cut up. So if the piece can't be, re uh, the mold can't be removed, a lot of times the piece can uh, lock a mold on so you can never take the mold off. So you have to cut the piece up um, if you're doing your own mold. So the silicone is what goes over your piece first. The silicone goes over your pieces and then a mother mold is made and the mother mold is plaster. The mother mold is what holds the shape of the silicone. So once you take your piece back apart and you take your original back out, back out, you can melt down the clay and reuse it. And that's what goes to the foundry and the foundry pours the foundry wax into the mold and the mold is, um, the foundry wax is poured as thick as they want to do the bronze. And then that mold of the wax gets taken out of the mold. And at the foundry, it probably goes through at minimum of 12 hands. So there's a wax room. So once the wax is taken out of the mold, there are people in there that sit and they use little hot tools and it's called chasing. So they clean that wax up. And if there's any cuts, or anything that didn't quite take right in a mold, they have all the tools. So they replicate the artist's pattern um, and their texture, and they clean it all up, and then that um, cleaned up piece of wax is dipped into what is called slurry. So it's a liquid, and then it's like a sand, and a liquid in the sand, and it's in that room at least three weeks. So the piece is dry, and it builds like the cement casing around it. So inside that cement casing is the, um, is the original wax that they had poured into the mold. And then that, once that's done in the slurry room, it goes into what I call a pizza oven. So the wax gets melted out, um, that's the tile lost wax process. And um, the, now there's the void in there, that little space that used to be the wax, and that's what the hot um, bronze gets poured into. So that goes on to a special hanger, and then the bronze is poured in, and I think it's like 2,000 degrees. It's pretty hot. It's very interesting if you found a YouTube to find that and um, um, get an idea of, of all that it takes to do a bronze. So once that's cooled, it goes into a special chamber so it won't cool too quick. They use a sledgehammer, jackhammer, they take all that shale off, they sandblast it, and then there's another artist that's a welder, that will put your piece back together. And when you do cut it apart, you have to score it. So if I were to cut her arm off, I would do little score marks so that at the very end, the welder can find those score marks, match up the piece the way it's supposed to be, weld it back together. They also cut windows out to help them reassemble the piece. So once it's back together, um, it goes to the patina artist. Um, I always like to go to the foundry at this point and it's called 2%. So you check your piece, make sure that it was assembled or there's not any little pieces that are wrong. If sometimes the mistakes are on my end, not necessarily the foundries, so they can make all those corrections. And then there's a wonderful person by the name of Bart at um, the foundry I use is Parks Bronze in Enterprise, Oregon. So he's done some patinas that I couldn't ever get at any other foundry. He's fabulous. Um, and that's the uh, biggest reason why our bronze is so expensive is all that process. There's so many hands that, that your piece goes through before it's even, even a little guy like this has to go through every single step. It's pretty cool. So this is a piece, so there's a call to artists. Um, every time the city adds a public piece of art, it goes to call to artists and it's an online program called the Cafe. So any artist can go to the Cafe and um, find out what's being offered on a public art basis. And the city of Coeur d'Alene put a call to art and it was to be about human rights and our Coeur d'Alene's ability to um, be very inclusive this art piece is all about what we stand for. And um, on the call to artists, the first step is, is just them picking three to five artists. The call went out to all of the US. So from all the people that um, applied, they, they picked three to five. There must have been a lot of people to respond, so they had five people. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those five. So I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to try and um, represent Coeur d'Alene in that way. And so this is my idea. It's due December 1st of this year. So um, by the time 
you're seeing this, um, it's already out for vote. Um, it can be voted online. You can go online to Coeur d'Alene City, I think, to find um, the five pieces that will be representing, um, possibly representing Coeur d'Alene. Um, so this is, I've just started it. Um, I still have my way to work down. And the Coeur d'Alene tribe, um, there was a chief in the mid 1700s called Circling Raven. So I don't have a picture of Circling Raven, but I do have some um, pictures of um, some of the chiefs. They were just, a, you know, a few um, generations down. So I found an early generational um, Coeur d'Alene tribe member chief. So I'm depicting him and this raven. So I kind of have him looking up at him. So the idea of that the raven was looking, they taught him to look for the, the black robe, which turned out to be the Jesuits. So as I go work my way down, I also wanted it to represent Coeur d'Alene. So in the backdrop, I made the shape of the lake. And it's just in different colored clay at this point. But when it comes to the patina, the patina can pick up, the, the artist can put another color in. And we also have a lot of our histories about logging and the railroad, so that's going to be in the backdrop. And as I work my way down, um, Bill Wasmuth, um, there's other people that I want to depict that played a role in the direction that Coeur d'Alene has gone in um, being more equal. And um, so this is just the very beginning, and um, you guys will get to see the end result soon. And I sure appreciate you coming in and seeing my studio. And I thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful Christmas and Happy New Year.